and welcome to the Friday show. Happy Friday, May 20th. Uh, today we're going to open it up and I'm just going to answer questions today. We don't have a specific topic. I'm here to answer your questions. There's been so many shows recently where I haven't even come close to answering all your questions. Good morning, Kiana. Good morning, Heather. Where are you guys watching from? I will say today here in Nevada, it is quite a windy yucky day and the wind is never fun to work in the dogs don't seem to mind it but i think we do more than more than they do heather how's it going kiana good morning rhoda good morning good morning drop in your questions if you're just tuning in i'm here to answer any of your dog related questions, whether it's from one of the breeders that I mentor, one of the owners of mine, or any dog. Um, ask me, ask me. Good morning, April. Good morning, C. Carrie here in Cardiff. It's May gray in full swing. Our day is very gray here as well. I do not know that we'll have any sunshine today. It's cloudy and windy. Lexington, Kentucky, 82 degrees, partly cloudy. That's not too bad. That's a, a nice day to go out and play with the dogs. Shannon, good morning. Agnes, good morning from California. Laura, good morning. Columbus, Ohio. Kiana, we had a national wind advisory yesterday. It was windy in Seattle too. It must be blowing down here. Amanda, I was interested in info on your guardian care dogs. I recently saw your post for two, but I can't find it now. We have Azalea from Fergie's Flowers. Hey, Amanda, shoot us an email. We do still have those two dogs available for our guardian home. So just email us at 4 kennels at gmail.com and we can uh, start talking about that. Super exciting. Tina, good morning. Mesa, Arizona. Is it windy there too? Like is, is Kiana sending the wind all the way from Seattle all the way down to us and all the way down? I think she is. I think you're to blame. <laughs> uh, Kristen, good morning from Memphis, Tennessee. I've never been there. I will have to say, Carrie, a question. Awesome. And any of you that are just tuning in, I'm here to answer your questions today. So drop them in and let's hash out some dog related questions. North Carolina. Good morning, Jennifer, joining us from North Carolina. Carrie's question. I have a female golden doodle who, when was a puppy, ate Purina Pro Plan and would bleed a lot. So I switched her food and it's been fine. So she's now she's pregnant. I started her on puppy food yesterday. And what do you know? I woke up to poop and blood all over. What could be happening with puppy food and her? So it's, you're doing pre and pro plan. So it's chicken and like it mainly has the same ingredients. My concern would be that there's just some colitis or some kind of um, other issue like that. You can't give her metronidazole when she's pregnant. But metronidazole is fantastic for helping just take down, you know, it's kind of like an inflammatory. It helps coat the belly. It helps if you're dealing with parasites or other issues. Um, I, I can't think of any kind of connection with them being um, by switching, like you switched food and it was fine and you switched to another food. Is, is that what you're saying? Like, is it all pre and pro plan? What was your second food you fed that she wasn't causing basically colitis or some kind of issue. My other concern would be too, a lot of times we switch food, but it really had something to do with some kind of parasite or protozoa like Giardia or Coccidia that can cause so much inflammation and damage to the intestinal tract that they will have blood in their stools. Um, so I would definitely get a fecal uh, for sure on her. I, I just can't imagine. Again, I would need to know like exactly what food you were switching to and what she was on other than the pre pro plan. Um, it, it wouldn't just be, I can't think of anything or any reason why it would just be related because it's puppy specific, uh, food. So is she chewing it? Well, is, she, is the, is she digesting it? Okay. Is there some, I would think there's something else going on. It may be coincidental. So I would look at, look at other issues as well to ensure that, um, she doesn't continue having bloody stools. That's never a good thing. April, it's super windy in Las Vegas. I thought one of my puppies was going to blow over the fence. That's not good. Ooh, hot in Mesa. Gradual switch. See, yeah, that's a good, another good point to bring up when you're switching dog foods. I always tell my clients, think in nines. You should, you should commit to keeping your puppy. Anytime you buy from anybody or get a dog from somebody, you should commit to keeping your dog 
on do that dog food for nine weeks. It takes that long for the body to truly um, switch food. So nine weeks, you're committed. Keep in it for nine weeks anytime you switch food. And it should take you nine days to switch the food. So you do three days, 75, 25, three days, 50, 50, and then three days, 25, 75, you're doing the newer food 75% and you're just kind of phasing out the older food. Um, so I'm not sure if this, if that transition was done, if it, if you're just seeing the bloody stools right um, upon starting a new food. So there's lots of things that you can do, but in general, anytime, unless it's a medical emergency or severe allergy that, that has been confirmed, we always say, once you try a food, if you're going to trial a food or try something new, you have to commit for nine weeks for the other food to truly leave the system to know, is this new food, this different food, better for my dog? I am a firm believer there is not one dog food for every dog, and so sometimes we do need to make some changes, but I also believe more than not, we have digestive issues and our first thing is like switch the food and then we still have digestive issues and we're switching again, you know, and people are switching three, four times in nine weeks. Well, of course, you're never going to get anything resolved and clearly it's not a food issue. And when you keep transitioning them to another food, you're just making things worse. Generally, more than not, it's not an allergy issue. There's something else going on in the gut. Could be, like I said, a parasite or protozoa that kind of uh, flares up now and then. It could be colitis. It could be a sensitive stomach. It could be the treats you're feeding them. It could be the grass they're out eating. It could be the bark they're out eating that has been treated. Like you have to look at everything that dog is ingesting and not be so quick to just switch their food. All right, Amanda adds, Annie's 11 months old now. I think she's slowly transitioning out of her mischievous puppy stage. What stage might she be in now, tween or... 18, 11 months old, definitely, definitely teenage still. Um, depending on the breed of dog, large breeds do mature slower. So we, cons we consider them adults, sometimes closer to two years old, or smaller breeds could be considered an adult closer to a year old. But 11 months old, def definitely still a teenager. I always think like that seven months where they really start their, their teenage uh, phase of just being uh, a little more challenging, needing a little bit more energy or a little bit more exercise, mental and physical uh, stimulation. And many times you have to reinstate the rules because what you did as a puppy and they're listening and following those rules, they'll start to challenge them all over again. So welcome to the teenage months of your dog. You'll get through it though. You're, you're close. You know, once you get 15, 16, 17 months, things will settle back down based on what we've seen. Jennifer says it's hard to believe food caused blood in her stool. Yeah, I, I think that's probably not as likely. Cassie, morning from Stockton, California. Foundation female first litter due in three days, expecting 13 standard golden doodles. So thankful to Bab or Badass Breeders. Ooh, that's exciting. Congratulations. Please make sure, Cassie, right now you have puppy formula on hand in case you do have to bottle feed. Please make sure you have a tube in case you had to tube feed. 13 is a lot. Um, and you know the, the uterus is horned, and so if you have more on one side than the other, you could get a few small puppies that will absolutely need your assistance immediately um, to ensure they're getting enough food. A few things you can do is have a stronger puppy suckle on a teat uh, initially to bring the milk down and then put the smaller puppy on it. You can do rotational feedings, take the largest five or six out and keep the smaller ones in for two hours. You can sit in the box several times a day and make sure those little ones are getting the best teat and not getting pushed off. They cannot compete. There's not 13 feeding stations, so there's always one not uh, getting any food. And the problem is the smaller ones, uh, just due to size and strength, tend to get continue to get pushed off. And they're using more energy and effort to nurse and they're getting less. And the goal is to get our little runts caught up. So we just step in and start bottle feeding, start offering and seeing, do they want the bottle? I would also recommend weighing twice a day with 13. So if you do start to have issues with one of them getting behind, you catch it very quickly. 
Unfortunately, newborn puppies, healthy as can be, though, decline very, very quickly. They're small. You know, your your small little runs could be seven, eight ounces, nine ounces, and there's just not a lot of time if they're not getting enough nutrition and they're burning a lot of calories and then they get weak and tired and then they're not getting anything and it can happen within 12 to 24 hours. You can lose them that quickly. So you're good don't be nervous stay on top of it though have formula have a preemie bottle we love the advent but there's other ones you can do and please please make sure you have a feeding tube if you don't order it now with a syringe in case like just be prepared now because if it does get to the to the point where you have to tube feed you won't have time to go find one or buy one because it's life or death and, and you just don't have a lot of time so um heating pads <laughs> and Put some food in the freezer because you're not going to feel like cooking for a long time. I'm excited. 13's fun. We've had a lot of 13. I have a litter right now, 13 puppies. Super fun. All right, Kristen. My one-year-old golden retriever female has a slightly recessed vulva and she hasn't had her first heat yet. Will the vulva be corrected with her first heat? She's one of my breeding prospects. Well, welcome to the Friday show, everybody. We've covered poop and now we're talking about vulvas. Um, typically, I mean, it's not my favorite to keep a female uh, for the breeding program if they do have a recessed vulva, but so often as they get older and they put on more weight, it will kind of pop them back out but we do we have some some kind of weird placements on some of our females as well you may need to help a little bit more and hopefully though like again some females swell more than others when they are in heat and hopefully just that alone will just pop that out and there'll be no issues but you may have to um you may have to assist in the breeding and make sure everybody gets where they need to go all right awesome thanks everybody Woo! It's, it's like nine o'clock in the morning heather i need help with allergies schroeder is allergic to corn rice potato tomato pea and turkey we had to take him off ppp chicken his canada fish-based food was just discontinued i found an earthborn holistic fish-based food to, tra to transition him to today is day two of him being fully transitioned he's chewing his paws worse than ever and was just put on Apoquil. <sighs> yeah, unfortunately, too, and, and I, I think you know this too, Heather, because I, with Hannah, every time I've ran an allergy panel, <laughs> she's been allergic to different things. So that tells me a couple things, that maybe it's not completely accurate, number one. Number two, it could change. Um, and sometimes we we're looking for such a specific food that it has something else in it that they're much more highly allergic to so i don't know if your panel shows you like is it just mild allergies to some of this so i, I wouldn't be worried i mean it sounds like he's already having chewing paws is, is an is an allergy issue did you also do an environmental allergy because spring is here um and, and i don't know if he's spending more time in the grass or um, something's blooming and it's causing issues chewing on the feet though typically is a food allergy Go back and see, though, if you've got percentages, because, I mean, at the end of the day, everybody can be a little bit allergic to a lot of different things. But when it builds up the system over time, it could be an issue or it may not be an issue at all. It might have hit on the panel and it wasn't. Um, were you having issues with him? Oh, they discontinued the food. Can you find something with closer ingredients or tr try to go back and put him what um, Lucy's on and try that food? I just, my only concern is sometimes we get these really, really specific types of, of foods. And the problem is there's no governance. There's, there's no panel. There's, there's no, nobody watching over and making sure foods actually meet the nutritional guidelines of a dog. There's none. Like literally you could put grass in a bag, market it as dog food and sell it. There's nobody governing or checking to ensure that it's nutritionally sound. That's why I do like the Avco, They what they say, and they don't actually put a, a stamp of approval on things. They don't actually certify a food, but what they do say is there's five companies that do meet what they feel are good guidelines for food and what makes good food. They have a canine nutritionist <laughs> formulating the dog food. I mean, imagine that. So many of these dog foods that no one has even done that. They have been trialed um, with dogs over time. And I know people kind of panic about, well, we shouldn't be using dogs 
um, in a food trial, but then you know what, if you didn't, now your dog is part of the trial <laughs> if it was never done. So, I mean, you can look at it either way. Um, the, the longevity of the food, the amount of recalls, there's quite a few things that they look at. Um, and so I don't, if I can remember the five companies off the top of my head, there's Science Diet, there's Purina, um, there's um, Canine, there's Eukanuba, and there was one more I can't remember, but you can look it up. It, it's there. There is five companies that they do feels best. So that, I, like that would be my concern. If we're going to get so specific about food, like is it even nutritionally sound, and what else is in it that's causing him problems? You can you can um, try keep him on a little bit longer and see if the biting of the feet gets better. Maybe it's still the other food getting through his system. But I think if this is something new that he wasn't doing before, then we need to look at something else. I know, fun, fun. All right, good morning. Rachel, good morning. Shannon, what do you do to save your lawn? The dogs are mostly fenced in backyard and most of our grass has been turned up due to them running back there resulting in mud and or dusty, dirty. Yeah, that's the problem, Shannon, is I know, I know I would love for, well, for a couple different reasons. Here, let's talk, because this is important. There's public perception, um, and then there's issues that breeders have to deal with. Of course, the public, and I would love to see all my dogs on this beautiful, lush green grass. But there's a few issues with that. One, they dig. Two, they're just gonna run the grass down into mud, and then the dogs are muddy. Um, three, female urine kills the grass. Four, you, you can't really clean grass and dirt. So if you are dealing with Giardia or Coccidia or roundworms or hookworms or God forbid distemper or parvo, like I can't ever truly disinfect and kill grass and dirt. So um, dogs tend to be on, our dogs too are on cement. We can bleach it, we can clean it. Um, they're on pavers, we can bleach it, we can clean it. They are in rock runs. We can also run bleach right through that as well. And um, and, and clean it, or at least when we scoop poop in a rocky run, we pick up the dirt and the rock. And so it does reduce the chance of cross-contamination or spread of sickness and disease. So it is, I've tried, and I've tried artificial grass for adult dogs and, and you know, over time they could, they could tear that up too. Uh, we don't have any of our dogs on grass, unfortunately, because it just hasn't worked for many, many different reasons. And I need to ensure the area can be kept clean and my dogs are kept clean and mud and muck um, makes things far more far more more difficult so dusty dirty dogs i know and the rock can you know throw up some dust and and it does make them a little bit dusty but overall that's much easier to manage than mud and muck i, I wish i had a, a better answer for you if you know I, I i get a little jealous sometimes when i see like these breeders are like out in nature, out in the mountains, out in the woods, and they can fence that in. And, you know, these dogs have trees and, and creeks and, and whatever to play in. It's just not reality for most people to be able to have dogs on grass or that kind of environment. So, fortunately, might have to look at rocking it or doing a variation of some rocks and pavers, some cement, some artificial, like make it, you know, vary it. Just the only thing when once you... Put rock in anything it gets kicked up on the cement or the pavers okay tina thoughts on the grain-free food caution redcm i had my puppy on the breeders grain-free puppy food for 11 months and now i'm learning this possible connection to dcm should i have his heart evaluated okay this is a good this is a good good question tina and this really became popular like two years ago there was some data um, and there was an increase of dogs with basically an enlarged heart and it was causing death. And specifically, more than anything, certain breeds, golden retrievers being one. And so they were trying to figure out what's causing this increase of DCM in our dogs. And what they really had felt is that they were on grain-free diet so they started collecting data and research unfortunately it was kind of messy they were counting on the reliability of of, of people being honest about what the dog was fed and uh, many times dogs are fed more than one thing or it could have been this that or the other they talked about peas and lentils being an issue in foods that could be contributing to that what i can say tina is there has 
that I have come across or my vet has come across or the community of um, experts that I know, there's been no correlation with the grain-free food causing heart issues. Um, however, there's there's also been no evidence to show that the dog should be on a grain-free diet. <laughs> like there's been no evidence to say that uh, it's healthier or that they should be on a grain-free diet. We don't do anything grain-free. None of our food on property is grain-free, um, and you know, no issues. So I don't. Um, you know, if the dog is doing good on the food and it meets the nutritional guidelines of what a dog needs, then I wouldn't worry. But like double check again, if it's not from one of those five dog food companies, anybody can put anything of any food in a can, in a bag and market it and sell it as dog food. And people have done a really, really good job marketing and, and, and we're suckers for it. We see kangaroo and sweet potato and wild venison or whatever. And we're like, and it's a beautiful bag. <laughs> like the marketing is on point. It's organic. It's grain free. And we think, holy shit, this is good. But the, the reality is that food most likely has never even been evaluated by a, a true dog nutritionist to make sure that the dog is getting a balanced diet. And, and that's kind of scary. So um, I would start there. I would look at the quality of the food that the puppy's on and then worry about the grain free later. Is there really a point to do that? Do some of your own research too. talk to your vet um, and then make your final decision on if you want to switch that food or not. That's my advice. C, question, C's question, what is the reason for wanting an F1B over an F1? Isn't hybrid vigor lost in an F1B? So this is a great question. Technically, yes, the hybrid vigor would be lost because when you look at the actual definition of hybrid vigor, it's a, a purebred and a purebred, but not the same purebred bred together. So the, the goal is you're getting the best of both breeds and hoping to reduce health issues seen in those specific lines. So if something's just um, a golden retriever issue, the chance of it being passed when bred with the poodle should be far less, right? And if you're using different lines too, because there's been a lot of inbreeding and inline breeding to preserve some of our beloved lines. But the problem is there's no perfect healthy line. And the more you continue to breed, you're going to continue to see those same problems. So that has been the goal and one of the goals in hybrid breeding is to reduce some of those even temperament and health issues. Um, but, you know, and then breeders have gotten real fancy and there's F1Bs. Now that means you've already taken an F1, a 50-50. I'm just going to say golden retrievers because that's, you know, what we do. So you take an F1 already. They're half golden retriever, half poodle, and you breed them back to a poodle again. And that's where the B comes from. F1 first generation. The B stands for back cross. So I'm taking an F1 already and I'm breeding to the poodle again. So technically, genetically, the puppy is 75% poodle. Although genetics don't play fair. Look at kids and families. Some kids look just like the father and some kids look just like the mother. And you can still get inconsistency in the F1B as well. They can be more retriever in personality. They can be, you know, a lot of them are much more poodly in looks and temperament because technically, you know, they're 75% poodle. Why would someone want an F1 over an F1B? I mean, I do see as a whole some differences in an F1 versus an F1B because you're breeding out the golden retrievers. So I, I tend to, again, overall, we do evaluations and we look and see, um, are we seeing more temperament of the golden retriever, the poodle? Does it really matter at the end of the day? They're both fantastic dogs. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I think it's really important to honor the integrity of the breed and not mix the integrity of the breed. So like I wouldn't take a guard dog, a, like a German shepherd and breed it to a poodle when the innate integrity of those breeds of the, their what they were bred to do is different. You have one guarding and one bird dog, right? And so the golden retriever and the poodle are both very, very similar in drive, what they were bred to do, the traits that were specifically looked at, fine tuned, um, and you know, the breeders committed their life to are very, very similar, intelligent, friendly, retrieving, right? Um, and so that's always been important to me to not mix the integrity of a breed and have, you know, great inconsistency. 
I think that can happen and I'm gonna have a lot of people not happy with me for saying this, but taking an Australian Shepherd that's meant to herd and mixing it with a poodle. They're beautiful, beautiful puppies, but then when you get a lot of complaints from clients thinking they're getting more of a, a doodle, there's this, you think a doodle and you generally think a golden doodle or labradoodle and then the Aussie doodle produces these beautiful colors and we get hung up on that and we don't remember we're not, or we don't know you're buying a dog that's half herding dog and you're wondering why they're chasing and nipping at your kids. Well, shit, that's what they were bred to do. That's the integrity of the breed. That's what breeders have spent their life fine tuning that these dogs will herd. <laughs> but yet now they're getting displaced out of their home for being a bad dog. So that's really, really, really unfair to our, to our dogs and to the integrity of the breed. I cannot stress enough, before you get a dog, you should know about the breed of the dog you're getting and does that fit in your lifestyle. So, um, I don't know where we're going back to the question. I can just get off on anything. What is the reason for wanting an F1B over an F1? Okay, so one that's 75% poodle versus one that's 50, there is greater consistency of getting a more poodle coat. So if we have an issue with uh, shedding, then, you know, we may want to do an F1B. In families, I'll find that like one per, one the husband or the wife or the partner had poodles growing up and they really, really loved the poodle, but the other one had a golden retriever and really, really loved the golden retriever. They may um, do F1 versus an F1B. They, they want the, the more even split. Sometimes it comes, I'm just speaking for my program, it comes down to a specific parent or a specific line that somebody wants or a specific color. Um, we do do both uh, the F1 and the F1B and we have found there's not one necessarily better for families. You know, coats can be more uh, consistent or the more poodle coat in the F1B, but you still get that little bit of influence of the golden retriever. Like how amazing is that? Like, right, everybody loves a golden retriever. So you just tone down the, the poodliness a little bit by um, infusing 25% golden retriever. And for many, that's just a really beautiful balance. I personally love the F1 because I'm a golden retriever girl. I love the poodle, don't get me wrong. But growing up, um, you know, I had two golden retrievers in my childhood. And so I, I'm drawn toward those characteristics more than a poodle, honestly. So, I mean, I love the F1, but you can get inconsistency in the coat as well. You can get a coat that does shed a little bit more. They're not going to blow their entire coat like a golden retriever does, but there will be more hair around the house. It's not that poodles don't shed. They still have to lose their hair. We all have to lose our hair. <laughs> Girls, girl, you know what I'm talking about when you shower and blow dry your hair and you have hair all over the bathroom. The difference and why we don't see that hair loss, that normal hair loss from a poodle is their coat is so tightly wound that when it falls out, it gets stuck in the coat. But this is one reason why, too, their coat is more difficult to maintain because it mats easy and the hair that normal that should be lost sticks to the coat. So your, your F1s or your golden doodles where you can kind of run your finger through their hair, you will have hair floating around the corners of your house a little bit. You could have a little bit of hair on your clothes or in your car or on your bed, uh, but grooming can be easier. So that is another consideration I talk a lot about with clients coming in is, is grooming a concern for you? You know, you gotta be a little more committed with the poodle. It can be harder to maintain. All right, great question. Uh, Carrie, vet had me switch her food when she was a little younger after the blood occurred and she's been fine. And now I, and now the switch led her to Royal Canaan puppy because she's pregnant and it happened, but it, it's like she poops and then drops blood all over the place. I mean, the amount of blood is insane, it's bright red. Well, so bright red would typically indicate that the bleeding is closer to the rectum. You're sure it's not from the vulva, like she's not bleeding. Um, there's definitely some kind of irritation or something going on, some kind of something. So I would, at this point too, and especially because she's pregnant and there's a considerable amount of blood, I would definitely take her to a vet and have um, her evaluated, absolutely. Sandy, we do raw for puppies. We also have one female that was allergic to everything, but raw was perfect. And that's a great point, Sandy. Like I am an, I am um, not an advocate, but I'm not against raw feeding when done right. It's, it, it's really, really good. For most people though, 
it, they don't get the, the nutritional uh, ratios correct and it can make things worse and, and even make your dog sick. Um, if all of that is done correctly and you have the time and energy to formulate, and there's help out there, it's not like you have to really figure it out. Um, there's tons of recipes. If you can do that, that's great. Or there's like Steve's Raw, like you can order it for, and it comes frozen and it comes in little cubes um, and you can order and it's all done. It is pricey, it, it is. And there has been benefits shown. There's been research done to say, even if you give your dog 50% of its diet or even 25% of its diet raw, um, there are health benefits seen to your dog. Just know though, if you do wanna to try to do that, you do wanna incorporate a little bit of raw into their diet, you cannot feed raw and kibble at the same time because it's digested differently and at different rates and it causes an upset stomach. Raw is digested very, very quickly. Kibble takes like eight hours. So they say feed raw in the morning. You know, if you're doing 50-50, feed the raw in the morning and the kibble at night. You cannot mix the two. Uh, Rhoda, our Ari is turning two years old this month. How much sleep is normal at this age? It seems like she sleeps a lot. Dogs sleep a lot, really. They really do. Um, they'll try to keep up with you if there's stuff going on, but and I've got my two dogs here. They're sleeping. I wouldn't worry as long as as I wouldn't worry as long as eating is normal, water intake is normal. So appetite, water, energy levels are normal when she is awake and she's vibrant and healthy and silly and like her personality hasn't changed. But they do sleep a lot. They sleep a lot as puppies. And then it seems like they sleep less going through sexual maturity and after. And then once we hit like that two years old, they start slowing back down again and they will sleep more. But as long as everything else is okay, I would not worry. All right. Agnes, I have a Labradoodle who's an extremely picky eater, thanks to the poodle side of that Labradoodle, right? <laughs> we tried magic dust and changed food slowly. The only thing that sometimes works is breaking up treats in her food. She'll do okay for a short while, but goes back to not wanting to eat. Any suggestions on a food topper? Um, I would ask too, is there any kind of teeth issues that hard kibble is difficult for her? Or you can soak it in just water or broth, uh, bone broth, and soak the food and feed it to her soft. You know, does she like soft over hard? Is that an issue? I don't know how old she is. Um, other food toppers, Parmesan cheese, yogurt, um, I'm trying to think, uh, a little bit of tuna oil or salmon oil you could put on there. Sometimes that's enough for them to get them to eat. Or like a, buy a can of canned food if you can match the same food and mix a little bit of can, like a quarter of the can on the food. Does that help? Sometimes they're picky eaters because you've trained them to be from the beginning or now when they don't really want to eat, you give them something better. So they've trained you. <laughs> if I just wait a little longer... Mom's going to fix this shit. I'm going to get something better. So they literally will wait it out. If you feel like this might, you may have trained this dog to be this way. As long as there's no other health concerns or not too thin, everything is absolutely normal. You can try to wait this out. A dog will not starve itself. They don't. They will not. So put the food down for 15 minutes, pick it back up. Try again in the evening, down for 15 minutes, back up, try again tomorrow. I mean, they can go several days. Like if, if you feel this is something that you have trained and you prefer to not keep playing this game, um, there's always that option too. You can try and do that. But fry an egg, Parmesan cheese, um, soften the food, soak it and see if it's an issue of hard kibble hurting their teeth. I don't know how old they are either though. Canned food, a little bit to coat on their food. Salmon oil, I'm trying to think. <laughs> Cassie, 10 teats on mama, lower our way full. Good, so Cassie's got the big litter of 13 coming. Happy Friday from all, uh, uh, Ontario. Regan, proudly raising another badass breeder litter, nine golden doodles, 18 days old. So awesome. You, this is a fun. I think like day 17 through 19 are the most quiet, right? So we're going to do some loud bangs, eyes, are, eyes and ears are open. You're going to start getting ready for a whelping box, whelping box exposure. You know, I just spoke at the seminar too. It's not about just like putting puppies in this enriching environment. It's about aligning the work and the way in which we do the work to their developmental benchmarks. So when we start work at three weeks old, this is the 
the most common age breeders ruin their puppies because we get so excited, you guys, because they're like toddling around. They're starting to vocalize with purpose. They can move forward, backwards, eyes are open, ears are open. <laughs> and you're like, oh God, little puppies. And we get so excited. We want to expose them to things because, you know, we want good puppies. We want confident puppies. We want puppies with good nerve strength. And we take them out of the whelping box and we put them in this like really enriching environment. And it's way too much too soon. And we end up doing the exact opposite of what we are trying to do. Now we're creating distrust and fear in our puppies. So at three, from three to four weeks old, we actually work the puppies in the whelping box. So we keep the environment the same and safe. And this is where they're born. This is where their mama nurses them. This is where their mama cares for them. And we bring in like novelty, non-scary uh, predictable, soft, or not even just soft, but items that wouldn't be abrasive if they, you know, they go to smell and it's pokey or something. Like I want everything super positive. So we just put them in the whelping box. We start the yes empowerment word, that marker word. We're saying, yes, you are brave. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you can trust me. So when they approach this this stuffed animal or this metal bucket or this piece of wood or this orange, we're like, yes, yes. And we're imprinting and laying this foundation that anything I offer to you is safe. You can be brave, you can be curious, you can explore. And we're not doing too much. You know, their, their, their little, little nerve endings aren't completely formed yet. Like they're very, very sensitive, right? But then when they hit four weeks, puppies mature very, very rapidly. Um, when they hit four weeks, we work them outside the whelping box, but close because it's still the same smell, right? Like right next to the whelping box. So it's still the same smell. They can still smell mom. All the sounds of where they've been raised are exactly the same. And now things can be a little more uh, unpredictable each week more and more challenging. And then when they hit five weeks, we start moving them to different locations. We have to have resilient, flexible puppies that can be put in any kind of environment and manage that kind of pressure and stress. That's really important. And if they can't, we can identify that, be the voice for our puppy, find the right human that understands that and will continue empowering them though so we don't have a fearful dog. There's a difference. There's a difference of like, I'm not super outgoing. I don't care to be put in new situation after new situation, but it doesn't mean does not mean I need to be fearful. So it's matching that that is so crucial and critical for our dogs and a huge mission that I'm on is truly honoring these puppies, being their voice and their placement, and then educating the human what this means and what this dog needs to thrive. Um, and that in itself is life changing. And that in itself will keep dogs in their homes. And that in itself will keep our dogs balanced and happy. And damn it, they deserve that more than anything. So um, anyway, bring in. I'm glad you're using our curriculum. <laughs> I'm like, yay, almost to three weeks, almost a whelping box exposure. And you know, something else about our curriculum too. And again, it's not just putting them in and taking them out. We meet the dog's needs in order. I, if you've been following me, we've talked about this. If you bought a dog for me, I talked to you about this on the virtual visit. Dogs have three, four basic needs. And I'm not talking about shelter and food. So let's eliminate that. After that, what's their first need in order? Rules, boundaries, and limitations. Number two, mental and physical stimulation. Number three, love and affection, but we get it wrong. We give them love and affection first all the time. That's what we need. That's not what they need. They need rules, boundaries, limitations, mental and physical exercise, then love and affection. And my curriculum, the way in which we do things meets the puppy's needs in order. For example, rules, boundaries, and limitations. You will be in this whelping box or you will be in this fencing. This is the way we move. This is what we do or don't do. Mom has rules, boundaries, and limitations, right? Okay, then number two, we put them into an enriching environment where they can do mental and physical exercise. This is every single day. And then number three, they get love and affection through our puppy massage and handling and holding them close to our heart and our face, and we are literally meeting their needs in order. And that is a huge difference in, the, in why our puppies are different, why so many breeders using my program are seeing such a huge difference in their puppies. We're honoring them as dogs, 
Um, and by doing that, that's when you truly can see the power of a dog to heal hearts and change lives. All right. Okay, where are we at? Back to a few questions. Tanisha, happy Friday. April, my three-year-old golden retriever female had her first litter, 216. I noticed over the last few days her coat seems to have thinned. Yeah, so this this is a big issue, April. And, you know, depending on who you talk to, <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you've been in the breeding world long enough, I assume, that <laughs> you could talk to five different people and get five different answers. And, and you're, you're going to find the same thing overall. You could talk to five different vets and get five different answers. You can talk to five long established breeders and get five different answers. Um, it has. We have moms that do blow their coat after delivery way worse than others. We have trialed different supplements going in and out of pregnancy, during pregnancy, to see if that would manage the loss of their coat. I have not found anything that truly works. Um, and like I said, we've tried many, many things. So for, for, for the most part, I, it's just like hormones. Women, some women lose their hair after delivery even, or during pregnancy, right? And so to me, some dogs will lose their coat after they've weaned their puppies. Um, and so I, it will come all back in and just make sure they've got a, a, a good, good uh, diet. And I always suggest if you're going to give your dog one, like, I think we have way too many supplements, first of all, and there's no true data to say that that supplement is supposed to do what it, it, they're claiming. The one thing I can say, and that my vet agrees with too, if there's one thing, really the only one thing you need to give your dog is salmon oil. So I would definitely have her on that. It's good for not only her coat and skin, but her joints and everything else as well. So squirt some salmon oil in there, she'll eat it. I have some picky dogs, oh, they will not eat the, they will not eat the salmon oil on their food. You can get tablets and administer like a pill as well. So I know it's terrible and you feel bad and they look terrible and it's just, yeah, it can be tough. All right. Suzanne, I have a litter of 11 Australian Labradoodle puppies born on Tuesday. Congratulations. I have one that has an ounce over, one that has lost, one that has lost an ounce over the last two days. Should I start bottle feeding now? Oh, yeah. Any kind of loss for us, and even in our software now, we input the, the weights every day. And once it inputs the weight, if, it, if the box turns green, it means, yay, we have a gain. If the box turns yellow, it means, hey, they did not gain, they did not lose, it stayed the same. And if the box turns red, it's like, hey, this is a loss. So we, we even get that visual indicator immediately. If we stay the same, even that caution, that yellow, they stayed the same in the last 24 hours, we step in immediately, even on the same. If there's been a loss, especially over two days, you got to step in right now, like, like immediately get a bottle. Um, starving puppies take a bottle usually very, very quickly because they are hungry. You do have to kind of pull it in and out of their mouth. You want to get that suckle reflex. You want to engage that, push the nipple to at the top of the roof of the mouth. You can squirt a little bit of the milk in their mouth too before you put the nipple in. But sometimes you really have to kind of um, work on getting that suckle reflex some are immediately because they're so hungry and I'm hoping this puppy's still strong enough that the minute you put that in the mouth it takes them just a few seconds to figure out how to suckle from a different nipple um, and they'll be off and running and then I would supplement now that we've lost an ounce over the last two days I would at least bottle feed twice a day it's a it's an ounce per basically an ounce per ounce so if the puppy is um, nine ounces, you can usually feed nine ounces, but I do have a bottle supplementation chart. You can divide by 24 hours. It's tough to do that if you're, if they're nursing also, because you don't know how much they're getting when they're nursing, but um, I would step in and fill that belly at least twice a day right now and then monitor. Yeah. All right. Lost an ounce. Yeah, got you. Got you. <laughs> Yeah, Laura talks about creeks having parasites in the water. I know, but we were just talking about dogs running through the river and having woods and I know, and then you have ticks too. And generally then where there's that, there's fleas. I know, and parasites in the water and raccoon poop and I know, whatever. There's never a perfect clean environment um, unless they're fenced and on concrete or something that you can disinfect. Fortunately, it's just the reality.
All right, sorry, running through, running through questions. So many this morning. Jenna got chicks, yes. Jenna does have a little chickens and they chicken poop all over. All right, you guys. I think we've, I know there's lots, lots more questions. I think I covered uh, most of them. Happy Friday, everybody. I'm Jeanette with 40 Kennels. We're not only healing hearts and changing lives with the power of a dog, but we are changing breeding from bad to badass. And man, I'm taking so many breeders with me. Like I shared a little bit today, it's not just about putting puppies in an enriching environment. It's about the way in which we do things, the order in which we do things, and by continuing to honor and respect our dogs and build trust that's what truly makes a difference. And I can't have these dogs that go out and devote their life to be a service dog, a facility dog, a therapy dog, or even a pet to be your life companion, to be there when you need them if they're not getting what they need as well. It has to be a give and take. Happy Friday, everybody. Bye.